Good lovely morning AAAB and viewers from around the world on this really just delightful May 31st here at the old al -Assad. John Diller is my name, uh, one of the chaplains here and here to lead us um, in a short time of worship. Today we do have a blessing. My dear friend uh, Chaplain Scott King is bringing the word to us today. So without getting um, into what he's going to talk about, trying not to, I'd just like to offer a word of welcoming prayer, and then you'll see uh, Chaplain King uh, delivering his last message for us here at AAAB, we think. Um, then uh, we'll come back and do a benediction at the end. So let's pray. Gracious Lord, in the beauty of the sun, in the promise of the new day, in the quickening of every breath that fills us, that we can attribute to your spirit, we want to give you just amazing thanks for providing for us, for tending to us, for granting us with so much of your uh, spirit of hope and wisdom and love. In the days right now when, uh, well, there's so much going on and we don't, we feel like we want to list them, but we know we'll leave something out. We pray that hearts can mend, that angers can be put aside, that families can heal, and that the whole world may turn to you and know that you are Lord and Savior. Bless, O oh God, Chaplain King's message, the work that he put in, but more importantly, the work that your spirit will do to take it to all the ears and hearts where it needs to land. And keep us safe here on al -Assad. And keep us safe around the world. That wherever we go next, we may arrive safely again to be repairers of the breach. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, for many of us here on the old Triple A-B, we're nine going on ten months of our little stay here. We've been under COVID conditions for about three months now. As a result, gyms have been closed and people are losing their minds as previously hard-earned gains are being <laughs> swept away <laughs> like dust in the wind. Amen. Speaking of which... The unique winds of AAAB are in full swing as they manage to gust at 30 miles an hour in every direction simultaneously, yes. defying both physics and reason, <laughs> thus treating you to an oven-like blast of scorching headwind every time you turn the corner. <laughs> the evidence of new life bursting forth here on AAAB is realized by the crunch of locusts under your feet, the fish you're jumping again in the blackwater pond, and at night you can be soothed to sleep by the gentle howling of the junkyard dogs. Temperatures are rising, unleashing the previously tempered potpourri of aromatic delights such as hot portageon, black water, and dumpster <laughs> runoff. And with all that, tempers are rising as well. Frustration, annoyance, and general weariness of dealing with the same old people day in and day out is kicking in. With the heat and COVID exhaustion, there seems to be an increasing lack of general courtesy, respect, and certainly love for others. Now maybe the strain has gotten to you too, and you find that you've lost that love and feeling, finding it more and more difficult lately to show love and kindness towards others, especially those who are particularly annoying and difficult to deal with. People who just seem unlovable. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I'd like for us to consider this morning. <laughs> loving the unlovable. So in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 29, we read this. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? What is the first and greatest commandment? 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. And the second? Love your, love your neighbor as yourself. yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, now, the first is difficult, but I get it. Not that God himself is a difficult person to love. I want to love God. He is worthy and deserving of our love. Mm. However, loving him with all of our being is difficult for us because we are selfish, self-centered, sinful people who want to love and please ourselves rather than God. That's no reflection on him. That's on us. However, the second commandment, perhaps even more difficult, not only is it hard to do, but quite frankly, I don't want to do it. Especially towards those who don't deserve it. What a bunch of rude, arrogant, selfish, good-for-nothing jerks. Show love towards them? Are they really my neighbor anyway? Quite frankly, who is my neighbor? The guy on the other side of that sheet of paper that separates our shoes? The people in the house next door on Chief Evan Drive in Fairbanks, Alaska? Who is my neighbor after all? That's the first thing we need to figure out. Because I want to know who I have to love and who I don't have to love. Much like a certain expert in the law who asked the same question of Jesus concerning the identity of his neighbor. Now in this account, we're told that this expert in law was testing Jesus. So his questions weren't really sincere. He wasn't asking to learn or for understanding, but rather to try to trip Jesus up or even get him to say something that would justify his position regarding his attitude towards love for certain people and not others. Now, he's an expert in the law. He knows who his neighbor is, and Jesus knows it as well. He knows what it means to be a neighbor. And he knows he doesn't love his neighbor. So he wants to narrow the playing field. He wants to lower the bar. So he asks Jesus to specify who exactly he has to love in order to fulfill the basic requirement of the law and therefore be justified. The very question suggests there were people he didn't love and didn't want to love. And it's not just a question of identification, but it was one of qualification and quantification as well. You know, it's similar to when Peter said, you know, how many times do I have to forgive? I know I have to forgive, but you know, up to seven times, what's the limit? How far does this thing go? Mm -hmm. Yes, I get that I have to love, but come on. Yeah. Surely there's a limit. This man wants to put boundaries on love. To love some, but not others. Jesus proceeds to show him, not only is he trying to get around the concept of neighbor, but he doesn't even really understand what it means to love. If you have to ask this question, then you don't get it. So, a priest, a Levite, and a Samaritan are heading down a country road. Sounds like the start of, <laughs> sounds like the start of a good joke, but seriously, folks. Uh, Jesus responds to the man's question by telling the parable of what we call the Good Samaritan. Now, it's interesting that Jesus never identifies this poor guy traveling down the road to Jericho. Simply, a man was traveling along the road. In all likelihood, he was an Israelite. We're not told, but it's fairly safe to assume. He's beaten, robbed, and left for dead. But the first to come along after this awful assault is a priest. Now surely a priest, a pastor, a chaplain if you will, would see and render aid to this poor innocent victim lying on the side of the road, right? That's what you would expect. Not this guy. Now some will argue, but a priest wouldn't go near what may have been a dead body unless he touched and it become defiled. I don't think this teaching parable was intended to be analyzed and scrutinized in detail down to the letter of the law. Rather, it seems the priest doesn't even go close enough to check and see if the man is dead or alive. He simply passes by on the other side, going about his business, pretty much ignoring the situation and avoiding any responsibility. Along comes a Levite, one who worked in the temple of God. Surely this servant of the Lord will have compassion and help this beaten, bleeding man lying on the road, right? No. Nope. 
Does the same thing. Avoids him as if he wasn't even there. Lastly, who comes along to save the day? A teacher of the law? No. <laughs> no, a Samaritan came by. And what was a Samaritan? Well, Samaritans were a group of people especially despised by the Jews. They were considered half-breeds due to having been part of the Assyrian conquest, captivity, and assimilation of other people groups in the region north of Judea. They were not true Israelites. Therefore, they were viewed as heretics by the Jewish religious authorities, which disqualified them from being considered a neighbor, and thus undeserving of love. This was the backdrop to the man's question. He knew it, and Jesus knew it. The Samaritans were in fact so despised by the Jews that when traveling north to south from Jerusalem, travelers would head south, hook a left, go east, down, around, all the way, and then come back to the west to get to Jerusalem, avoiding going through Samaria, lest they encounter these heretical Samaritans. So for a Samaritan to have been the true neighbor, demonstrating love and compassion for the victim, who again probably was a Jew, would have been a hard pill to swallow for this expert of the law. Now the word neighbor here, used in the text for the Greek, means one who is nearby. That's what a neighbor, neighbor is, one who is nearby. It's a generic term for a fellow man, indicating that wherever we are, the people around us, even if six feet away, whoever they may be, they are our neighbor, and we are to show love for them. But this parable is more than simply an illustration of who we are to love. It also teaches us what genuine love looks like. How we ought to love our neighbor. To what extent did this Samaritan show love to his neighbor? To what extent did this Samaritan traveling the rock, down the road find this man beaten and bloody to an extreme, right? Mm -hmm. To quite an extent. For he takes of his time and resources, stops his travels, stops his trip, goes over to this individual, patches up this stranger he doesn't know, puts him on his uh, donkey, and takes him into town to check him in at the local hotel. He didn't tell the owner, hey, here's a couple of bucks. Do what you can with it. After that, too bad. I guess you'll just have to throw him out, because that's all I'm willing to give towards this guy. On the contrary, he says, hey, don't worry about it. Whatever it takes, I'll pay it when I get back. I, I'm running up a tab for this guy. Whatever it takes, however long it takes, for him to, to heal and to become well and with all of this, I'm willing to pay the tab, whatever it is. And all of this was for a man he didn't even know and who, in all likelihood, hated him because he was a Samaritan. Love with no boundaries, both in terms of the member and the measure. Now, what about us? What about us? Do we set boundaries, limits, conditions on love in terms of who we're willing to love and to what extent are there people that we deem unlovable or perhaps we simply love less because of their race their nationality their religion their political views their social practices their theological distinctives of course not us right? no not us not among christians are any of you familiar with Facebook? Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of this, this thing called Facebook? There's no hatred there, right? Certainly not Christians spitting hate on Facebook, right? Sadly, there are a lot of experts in the law out there that like to pick and choose their neighbors. We tend to love those like us, whatever that is, and not those other people. We love those who love us. Those who are easy or easier to love. But what about those downright selfish, thoughtless, inconsiderate, rude people we encounter every day? Not so much. They ain't my neighbor, right? <laughs> that one ain't my neighbor. Really? 
See, we tend to use the, the if-then clause when it comes to loving our neighbor. If they change, well, then maybe. If they do something for me, if they deserve it, then I'll be loving towards them. Where do we get this concept of love that sets restraints, boundaries, and conditions? Not from God. Maybe we've forgotten or we don't fully grasp the love God has demonstrated towards us in Christ Jesus. Listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 5. This is verses 8 and 10. He says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? What do you say there? Amen. When? When? When did God demonstrate his love for us? While we were sinners. While we were still sinners. What else? He says, for when we were God's enemies. Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12. Remember that at the time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. Separate from Christ. Paul says in Romans chapter 4, verse 5, However, to the man who does not work but trusts God who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. God justifies who? Wicked. Those good, loving neighbors, all you little cute, cuddly puppy dogs out there that he just, just couldn't resist loving you because you're so wonderful. No. The wicked. <laughs> He's talking about us. Peter says in chapter 3, verse 18, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. God didn't decide to demonstrate his love for you after you got your act together, cleaned yourself up, and were living right. No, while sinful, rebellious, obstinate, selfish, arrogant, full of blasphemy, cursing, anger, and hate, while we were in this wicked, unrighteous condition, what did God choose to do for his enemies? He so loved the world that he sent his one another. And what kind of love is God's love? Boundless, never ending. Boundless. Agape. Unconditional love. What conditions have to be met in order for him to love you? His boundless, <laughs> unconditional love. What are those conditions? There are no conditions. So, as John tells us in his first epistle, chapter 4, verse 11, he says, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Jesus says in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 12, My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. As I have loved you. And how did he love us? Unconditionally. Hmm. Hmm. Unconditionally. So we're to love others unconditionally. unconditionally. Yeah, but <laughs> come on, right? But what? Genuine love, God's love, isn't based on an if-then clause. There are no conditions. There are no limitations. There are no boundaries. In order for us to love our neighbor, who is? Anyone. Wherever you are. Those people that are around you, your fellow persons, right? That's your neighbor. We must remember the love God has poured out on us. Believe it or not, and this may be difficult for some of you to grasp, but, but you are not lovable, okay? You are not lovable. None of us are. God loves us in spite of us. He gave us his, he gave his life to demonstrate that love for us. Now, was it only for us, all of us wonderful people here, or was it not for the whole world, right? Thank God also loves the selfish, thoughtless, God-hating, blasphemous neighbor as much as he loves you. 
So, who are you then? And I. About to show love for them as well. Why do you set limits on who and how and when you will love your neighbor? Are you more holy and righteous than God? When you refuse to love a neighbor, that's what you're saying. You are more righteous than God who is willing to show love and forgiveness towards them. You say, well, I didn't say that. Sure you did. Because when others offend you, attack your character, reject you, don't meet your self-imposed standards, and you choose not to love them because they don't deserve it, then you're saying your character and your standards are greater than God's. Who does love and offer forgiveness to them. Thank you, David. So, it's easy and natural for us to respond lovingly towards those who are nice and agreeable and easy to get along with, pleasant. The neighbors we like. Believe me, I, I get it. But we're called to love our neighbor, all people, with the same attitude of love in which God loved us, without boundaries, without conditions. Jesus said, but I tell you, Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. But love your enemies. Do good to them. Love my enemies? I want to hate my enemy. Bless those who curse me? I want to curse those who curse me. Our natural response is to return blow for blow, curse for curse, hate for hate. We want to give it back to those who unjustly mistreat us. We feel that not only we should, but we have a right to do so. To withhold love and kindness from those we deem as undeserving because of their attitude and treatment of us. But, what does Jesus say? Love your enemies. Do good to those who mistreat you. You say, but I can't do that. I can't do that. Well, you're right. You can't. Nor can I. None of us can. But who can love like that? God himself. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, John says, Dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. So love comes from God. Who is love? He is the source of love. If love does not come from within our natural selves. John says that those who love have been born of God. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, to be born of the Spirit, to be born again, to be regenerated, given new spiritual life in Christ when we believe and receive the gospel of salvation in Christ by grace through faith. It's through the Spirit of God living within the life of the believer, bearing His fruit in and through our lives, that we are empowered to love our enemies. It's a supernatural love. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 16, he says, I pray that out of His glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. The Spirit in your inner being, Christ dwelling in your heart, revealing his love, manifesting love, his love, his love and power working in and through us. Paul says in Romans chapter 5, God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. It's not a love that is natural to us. It's a supernatural love that God reveals in and through our lives. And again, in Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit, right? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Whose fruit is it? The fruit of the Spirit. Spirit. 
The fruit of the Spirit, not mine. Can I love my enemy in my own strength? No way. Can I bless those who curse me out of my old nature? No. Forget it. But when I choose to yield myself to the Holy Spirit living within, saying, not my will, but yours be done, then God can demonstrate his love for others in and through me as a testimony of his love, and it's to his glory and to his honor. Not I, but Christ in me, the hope of glory. Mm -hmm. Now, are you willing for God to perhaps humble you, to bring you to that place of submission where you can say, Yes, Lord, love my enemy. I can't do it, but you can. But I'm willing for you to love my enemy. Or do you say, forget it, no way, won't do it. You don't know what they did. You don't know what they said about me. Well, it may be pretty awful. But what did they do to Jesus? What did they say about Jesus? And yet he demonstrated his amazing love by giving his life for them, for us, while we were yet his enemies. So, you may be feeling especially frustrated and challenged, right now especially, to show love to your neighbor. Whether in the bigger challenges of life or just the day-to-day -day irritation and friction of rubbing shoulders with people who are not very caring or thoughtful. However, we're called as believers, followers of Jesus, to love our neighbor, who is those around us, right? Our neighbor. So, in order for us to love our neighbor, we must not lose sight of God's amazing love for us, his unconditional love, love we certainly don't deserve. And we must be willing to surrender our prideful, self-righteous attitudes that set limits on who we will love and how much we will love by laying them down at the foot of the cross. Then we can humbly say, I can't, Lord, but you can. Let me be a vessel of your love to a lost and dying world that desperately needs to see the power of your amazing love. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Chaplain King, and God bless you and your family as you prepare for your PCS move and for the whole uh, brigade and the battalions as they get ready to uh, move through the process of exiting theater. And now to all of us who are worshiping on this Sabbath day, the grace, mercy, and peace of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit rest with you, guide you, keep you this day and all days. Thanks be to God. Amen. See you soon, friends.